last presentation is from Patrick Nicholson. He's one of the neurology residents that get to come spend time with the neuro-ophthalmology group here. He's in his last year of residency and originally from Logan, Utah. He's going to be speaking to us about central serous retinopathy versus optic neuritis. And he said that he had wanted it to be more of an unknown, but since it was already printed up here, that this meant it's not so much of an unknown now. But, okay, thanks. Great. All right. Thanks for that introduction. Um, so again, I'm from the Department of Neurology, so it's a little bit of a uh, been an adjustment in a, a little bit of a new world here at the Moran Eye Center for the last um, several weeks. There have been a lot of great uh, learning opportunities in neuro-ophthalmology, um, but uh, as it's an adjustment, hopefully I don't uh, mix up my dexterous from my sinister eye and confuse everyone. But um, I'd like to present a case that we saw in neuro-ophthalmology of unexplained vision loss and implications when treating the unknown. So, just a brief outline. Um, again, I'll present the case, and then I'll dis discuss a treatment course that was implemented um, actually before the patient uh, came for evaluation at the Moran Eye Center. Um, and then the sort of impacts that that had on the, on the case outcome. So this is a 35-year-old man who presented to an outside ophthalmologist with the acute onset of diminished vision in the left eye. Um, he had actually woken up in the, in the morning, had had normal vision the night before, uh, and woke up to find that when he would uh, close his right eye, look out of his left eye, things were uh, blurry and darker is what he reported. Of note, he did not report any eye pain, uh, did not have any double vision, um, and he did have some abnormal kind of uh, coloration tinting phenomena, which he described as when he was looking at a white background with, the, with that left eye, he would see kind of a, a purple or greenish tint uh, or coloration. So just a little more patient background. Otherwise, very, very much mostly healthy, 35-year-old male, um, hyperlipidemia, but he was on no medications, no history of, uh, no family history of visual problems or himself, any past history, um, and no family history of autoimmune disease or multiple sclerosis. Um, he did not report any drug use. Um, so uh, on the records that we were provided and on outside evaluation, on exam, he'd been noted to have 20-20 uh, vision in the right eye and a slightly decreased 20-30 in the left eye. Um, it was clearly documented uh, that he did not have uh, any evidence of a, uh, an afferent pupillary defect. Uh, the provider noted that he had some trace cells in the left uh, anterior chamber but there was no disc edema on fundoscopic e exam. Um, the margins appeared clear um, and no evidence of swelling. Um, he did, so formal visual field testing showed a small area of, of central uh, visual field defect in the, in the left eye um, with Humphrey visual fields. But uh, retinal nerve fiber layer uh, OCTs were done and they were uh, normal. Um, and of note in the evaluation, the, the provider noted that the, the patient was uh, observing kind of this time a pink tinting to, the, to a white background when being evaluated. So um, maybe not a whole lot to, to hang one's hat on, but, the, but a treatment plan was kind of de developed by the, um, on the outside. Uh, for a presumed left optic neuritis. The provider had this patient with uh, kind of otherwise perhaps unexplained uh, vision loss and kind of and developed a plan to treat with, with this in mind. Um, because of the trace cells in the, in the left eye, um, there, was the, there was also some documented concern for iritis. So that influenced the treatment plan as well. Uh, before, uh, before doing that, actually, an MRI brain was obtained uh, in orbits, and that was normal. Um, but for the treatment, uh, the patient was started on systemic steroids with an IV burst of uh, solumedrol and subsequent oral taper for, the, for presumed optic neuritis, and then top, topical steroids to the left eye uh, for this 
you know, perhaps iritis. So uh, the patient was then seen by us approximately two weeks later. So in the interval history, um, with the implementation of these treatments, he had actually really experienced no significant improvement in his symptoms, still kind of continued to complain of the same uh, blurry and darker vision in the left eye and abnormal color phenomena. So now he arrives at the, at, at, at the neuro-ophthalmology clinic and on exam, he was actually 20-20 uh, in both eyes for visual acuity. Um, his pupils were very, very small, reactive, a um, little hard to evaluate because of their small size, but there was possibly a, a less than 0.3 log unit left APD. Fields were full to confrontation. His motility was normal. He did have some central distortion in the, in the left eye with Amsler uh, grid testing, but the uh, fundi did, uh, on our evaluation, also appear normal. Um, with cup to disc ratio of 0 0.7 bilaterally um, and no clear evidence of optic disc edema. Uh, our formal visual field testing with Humphrey uh, visual fields was normal. So whereas on the outside he had previously had a very uh, a kind of small uh, central defect on the, uh, on the left, this was uh, not present on our evaluation. The retinal nerve fiber layer, OCT, showed, you know, normal, young appearing, robust thickness of the, of the um, nerve fiber layer, but no, no, uh, no substantial uh, swelling or substantially increased um, thickness. So at this point, we are kind of maybe in a similar position to where the, where the outside provider had been. Not, not, uh, not a whole lot to go on, but um, because of some of the tinting and the color abnormalities that he was experiencing, that raised some question of a possible, uh, could this be a retinal problem? And uh, macular uh, OCTs were obtained. Uh, and this got us perhaps a little more on track. So um, in the left eye, uh, we can see this uh, fluid inclusion, subretinal fluid inclusion, that uh, pointed us in the direction of central serous, central serous chorioretinopathy. So in reviewing this case and kind of going over it, it is actually CSCR um, really provided a good explanation for his symptoms and presentation. Um, certainly he was also the correct demographic, uh, young male, and as you know with the you know, high stress postulated to potentially play a role which um, I didn't mention in the initial HPI, but certainly he had uh, that actually as part of his history and um, was, uh, had been very busy with his employment and uh, somewhat stressed. And uh, un perhaps unfortunately, but um, CSCR, um, as you know, uh, was likely, you know, quite possibly, perhaps even likely exacerbated by the steroid treatments that had been undertaken. Um, so certainly over the course of the two weeks before he presented to us, um, had, had not had improvement in his symptoms. And then, uh, not exactly what we were expecting, but uh, unfortunately it, it, it appeared that he'd had another adverse outcome from the, from the treatment that had been in, in, implemented. Uh, his intraocular pressures were 22 on the left, 51, or sorry, 22 on the right. I did what I said I would do. Um, f 51 on the left. Um, I think we can go beyond likely. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, scratch that. Uh, secondary to topical <laughs> steroids. So uh, needless to say, the steroids were tapered. He was started on Combigan and Latanoprost. And fortunately, it returned uh, for one week follow-up and intraocular pressures had normalized. Um, also at one week follow-up, 
the macular OCTs were repeated. And as you can see, this is the baseline. This is, this is the one that I had already showed when he first came in. And this is one week later. Um, there had been substantial improvement in the central serous chorioretinopathy. Um, and this uh, sort of shows the relative change in thickness uh, from the, the first macular OCT to the, to the follow-up here. So clear improvement in that. And also the patient uh, reported uh, not complete resolution of his symptoms, but definitely uh, improvement that he'd experienced during that week. So to kind of uh, bring this together a little bit as a, you know, a, a take-home message, um, in, we know from optic neuritis and the kind of landmark study, the optic neuritis treatment trial, that there's benefit to uh, high-dose steroids in, uh, in optic neuritis. Uh, they influence a speedy recovery of the visual uh, deficits. And also, uh, there's the evidence shows that, 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 that they may reduce the risk of further demyelinating events or, or progression to multiple sclerosis. So certainly, that um, has been something that really influences treatment in optic neuritis. But I think as this case shows, it's important to, uh, you know, there, there are certain implications for that treatment, and they can certainly have uh, adverse effects uh, beyond kind of what we even normally think of with, with steroids. Um, and uh, I think in kind of reviewing this case, just for, for my education and just things that might be gleaned from it, are certain points that probably should have suggested against optic neuritis. Um, and those were the lack of, relevant, uh, of relative afferent pupillary defect, um, which would normally be seen, and uh, no eye pain, which I didn't actually know just how uh, quite sensitive the presence of eye pain is for optic neuritis. So in the optic neuritis treatment trial, 92%, which I found pretty high, had, uh, had eye pain. Um, and subsequent um, studies in optic neuritis have shown that really over 90% uh, of patients with optic neuritis will complain of eye pain. So the, you know, although it's not 100%, the lack of eye pain certainly would be suspicious in this scenario. And then the, um, the kind of maybe more um, uh, positive phenomenon or, or abnormal colorations that seem to kind of vary in terms of his color tinting uh, perception uh, of the white background uh, was for us perhaps the feature that, that led us to also consider uh, a, a retinal process or, or want to get a better look at the macula, which then um, ultimately helped uh, with, the, with the final diagnosis. Um, so that is kind of what I wanted to, to emphasize from, from that particular case, but again, it was a good, a good learning case for, for me and something that I will see in neurology with optic neuritis um, and an entity well known to, to ophthalmologists that was very new for me with uh, central serous chorioretinopathy. So thank you. Yes? So uh, I'll defer to Paul on this because he obviously knows a lot more than I do about it. But it's, it's interesting from what I've been able to gather that uh, this is a disease in which we really don't have a good idea of the overall incidence. Mm -hmm. We don't have a good idea how many people are out there that are uh, essentially minimally or to them asymptomatic. Or there's not enough to bother them. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason that, that that's come along is, is that you know, we'll do an OCT, we're looking at pathology in one eye, ooh, there's a little central serous in the other, that's, yeah, I have those little funny tints and things like that. Uh, and so I just submit, because that's the case, that our concept that this is the, the hard driving, professional, you know, yuppie type who's more commonly 
might it not be mm -hmm. the ones who are most likely to complain to seek care. OCD about life in general? Mm -hmm. I just don't think we've verified that's necessarily a risk factor. We just see it more commonly. Mm -hmm. And that what we need to do, and to my knowledge, we haven't done yet, Paul, and if I'm wrong again, but I've not seen the study in which we just take you know, a population of 30 or 40 and just do an OCT of, of hundreds of thousands of everybody mm -hmm. and see you know, what is the overall incidence, how many people are symptomatic. But I've certainly seen plenty just from my viewpoint where I've picked up a little, a, a little obvious little central serous and, and frankly the patient said, well, I've never really noticed it. Mm -hmm. The measure may be a little something at that point, but because people are used to a binocular vision, and, and as long as it's not too off, unless they're checking it, they don't really notice that there's something off, where I think uh, more OCD people are likely to pick it up. Paul, am I? Just, it's possible. I mean, I think that there's still at least when retina, retina people, there is, there is still a little bit of association with stress, and it's thought to be cortisol levels, and so it still can be tied into steroids. It's, it's hard to say, but we see more. Another way that we evaluate these patients for central serous, which I didn't see, which I would recommend once you've diagnosed, is a floor scene is still good to see where the leak is and decide how you may want to treat it. And also, autofluorescence can be very good because you can see patches. Of, there's a lot of people out there with chronic central serous, and they'll have patches where you can see where they've had episodes that were not in the phobia. And you can see that there's, there's something. Mm -hmm. The whole character, there's a whole group of chronic central serous. But the point I wanted to ask you is if you were getting an OCT, or we'll talk to the outside doctor, if you're getting an OCT, um, a nerve fiber layer OCT would not be my first choice. I'm not even sure what even in optic neuritis what you would be seeing there, or you could be picking up glaucoma. It, at least in the retina world, we would be getting a macular OCT with any sort of you know, we get it on almost anything. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you think about it, you get it. Yeah, yeah. and a, a nerve fiber layer is pretty pretty low yield, while it's a, a macular one. And clearly, whichever the outside doctor had an OCT, they just ordered the wrong test. And if they had done that one twenty dollar test, they would have avoided everything. You know, a multi thousand dollar workup for this patient, yeah. and actually get yeah. 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 <laughs> 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 So the one thing about an active OCT is most cases of central serous, it's, it's pretty straight. I mean, you, whoa. Yeah, I mean, any, any qualified person says that's not normal, and they'll just send it on to us. Oh, there's a, this one. Where's the point? Here's the point. I just wanted to comment that, you know, we often, uh, the day before we rule out the symptoms, we will check the patient's blood pressure, and we'll see that they have a lot of fire. So I predict the way technology is going, within a decade, you're going to have an iPhone app that will do an OCT. <laughs> I think I'm kidding. I, I, I absolutely have seen some amazing stuff. I'm just going to make three quick points. So uh, Patrick advertised these visual fields as being normal. They're not. The one thing that's abnormal is the foveal threshold over here in the, uh, uh, in the left eye. And that's his symptomatic eye. So, but, but the problem is, is that most of us turn the visual <coughs> threshold off, especially if you're in a busy uh, community clinic or if you're a glaucoma specialist, you, you, you should turn it off to make the test faster. And, that, and, and you would have completely missed the problem if you had your foveal threshold turned off. This is a mistake that I see a lot of people make, you know, especially if you're uh, examining a patient with central complaints, you want to have the foveal threshold turned on. And then, Patrick, if you could go to the, um, the la almost the last slide where you said there were the things that said it's not optic neuritis. And the one thing that I was, would add here is that the MRI was normal. And I think there was a time when MRI scanning wasn't good enough to pick up a mild case of optic neuritis like this would be. And there's also you know, radiologists that will miss mild optic neuritis if they're not looking for it carefully or specifically, especially if they weren't given a proper history, which is often the case, which is why we encourage people to go over the MRI with your radiologist, make sure they understand what the problem is, make sure they understand what you're looking for. 
uh, but this clearly was a normal MRI. And then, um, you know, uh, to, to Eileen's point, which I think is really, uh, uh, really important, and that is, uh, you know, Patrick had mentioned that if you get IV steroids in a patient with optic neuritis, they get better quicker. And he also mentioned that they have a lower risk of developing MS, but that risk is only decreased for two years. And I think that's only true if you have at least one other white matter lesion in your brain, which this patient did not have. So actually there was zero benefit of giving this guy IV steroids, even if he had optic neuritis. Unless he was having a lot of eye pain or very decreased vision, it was really uh, the wrong thing to do and uh, might have exacerbated his underlying problem, as I was saying. Yeah, James? Uh, Dr. Kent, I just had a question. Would it have been useful to have color vision plates and or red cap desaturation? Because that can kind of, at least I think sometimes, point you in the direction of optic nerve versus retina. And I usually like to use those and see, and if it's a positive red cap desaturation, I'm much more concerned that it is the, the nerve or positive, you know, decreased Ishihara plates. Yeah, Would I think that have been helpful in the initial? I don't, you know, I think in differentiating optic neuritis from a macular problem, I think, I'm <coughs> guessing that both were, would have been decreased. And I don't, I'm not sure that would have helped. A flicker fusion might have helped, not, most of us don't have that in our clinic. But even a flicker fusion can be decreased by a macular problem. Yeah. De deciding whether it's optic nerve or retina is such a fundamental part of what we do in neuro-ophthalmology clinic, and there's never one test you can hang your hat on. Yeah. It's, it's doing, it's, it's looking at the, yeah. Yeah, Nick. One other question, actually for Paul and the retina guys, I've always been puzzled by this. The uh, association with stress and central sewage retinopathy. I just, maybe it's just me and I should never say never. If I ask a patient, are you under stress? Do you have to think of the stress now? I don't say yes. Yeah. Are you under stress? Oh, gosh. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. I do remember one this guy came in with plastic septic surgery. Absolutely denied ever having stress in his life. And he really didn't care that he had septic surgery. You know, they, they believe that it's actually how you respond to the stress and your type of personality more than the amount of stress you have in your life. They think that people that internalize stress more and push harder on that stress tend to have higher levels of corticosteroids in their uh, in their uh, serum and also tend to have higher uh, adrenal um, responses, both of which experimentally cause CSR. You can actually cause an experimental CSR by injecting somebody with a bit of epinephrine. Um, and so they do that in mouse models quite frequently. And they, they think that that has a high association and they've also showed it in some drug studies where people have taken ecstasy um, and other uh, other some pathomimetics that cause the central serum. So they think it has to do a lot with how you respond to the stress, not necessarily how much stress you're under. Uh, um, I might add to that, in, in asking that question about under stress, you might ask them how they have responded to a situation that we would normally find or Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks.